please welcome Professor Huber. Thank you so much for the very friendly welcome. Uh, I'm happy to be here again after two years. And this time I have chosen to, to talk on some, uh, some aspects of modern money theory. A rather theoretical and, and uh, complex um, subject. And uh, say reform campaigners, activists, so to say, may ask um, why bother to engage in, in such a, um, uh, a discussion of rather academic concern? And the answer is that uh, support uh, by um, academics and other economic experts is very important to make it onto the political agenda. And it seems to me that for the time being, lack a certain lack of expert support, um, particularly from academia, and um, more established, uh, more established uh, circles of academia, that is uh, a true bottleneck uh, for monetary uh, reform. Now, the, the background question to uh, modern money theory, or MMT for short, is whether uh, it, can, it is compatible with monetary reform in our sense, and whether it can be, it can be supportive of uh, monetary uh, uh, reform and whether mo uh, MMT is, is approachable to, to our goals. Now I should be explicit from the beginning about my own, uh, about my own point of view and this is, um, as Stephen already uh, said, this is currency theory because I think that um, currency school and banking school teachings are particularly well suited to explaining what monetary reform is about and useful um, to answering that question how far MMT and monetary reform might or might not go together. Um, I want to point, to point out, however, that uh, making reference to those teachings from the beginning of the 19th century uh, does of course not intend to replicate these in their original form but in an updated, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, modernized, modernized form, um, and carving out, um, uh, carving out the certain core components, uh, which have proven to be, which are, have proven to be valid uh, over time. Now, the following synopsis here uh, contains a number of uh, relevant, uh, relevant aspect, and uh, the first is that currency teachings already 200 years ago up to the present day start from a critique of fractional reserve banking. And fractional reserve banking, as you all know, is, uh, is considered to be illegitimate in that it grants special privileges to the banking sector and is considered to be dysfunctional in that it results um, in, uh, on balance in unrestrained bank money supply and uh, causing uh, various, various types of problems and crises. Uh, banking teachings to the opposite, uh, not surprisingly of course, uh, deny this and they say if, if we have crises but uh, if there are crises there are other reasons than monetary ones. The money and banking system is no problem, there must be other reasons um, for crises. Uh, currency teachings are or have been already 200 years ago a theory, a theory of modern money, a mod money that can be created at discretion, not necessarily being dependent on, on, a, on, a, uh, on a, a base of bullion and sil silver coin and so on. And because uh, any amount of money can freely be created at discretion, uh, currency teachings say that there must be some control of the money supply because banks, banks don't control the money supply. Banks pursue their own business policies but there is no control of the entire money supply. And so there must be some arrangement to make sure that the money supply keeps uh, uh, within a... Uh, that the money, the money supply is commensurate to... Uh, the economic uh, the, the potential of productivity. 
Uh, banking teachings, by contrast, say that um, you, you need no such, such a control because uh, the money supply takes care of itself because we have efficient markets. Uh, efficient markets, unimpaired uh, markets are the answer to that question and they will find some sort of, of equilibrium and so to say the, the market decides of what the, the adequate and the right um, money supply is and that, that efficient, uh, efficient money market and efficient financial market hypothesis came in various variants over the two last two centuries. The last ones were the efficient financial market hypothesis by Pharma, uh, referring particularly to information aspects and also um, Hayek's market theory um, attributing to markets and market participants some sort of superior crowd intelligence say. So the next question is uh, whether uh, uh, um, money is a creator, a creator of, of the law or uh, of public law particularly or whether it's a creator of public co uh, private contracts and currency teachings um, are in favor of what is now called the state theory of money and uh, the, the, the idea is constitutionalist so to say that uh, money is a part of a state sovereign prerogatives uh, comparable to the prerogative of lawmaking and uh, the, pr uh, the, the monopoly of taxation or the monopoly of um, um, using force and so on. And uh, uh, control of money is a question of a nation state's monetary sovereignty and the state's monetary prerogative includes uh, three components uh, the first is determining the currency in the sense of the official unit of account, say the, the US dollar or the euro or, or similar. Uh, the second um, component is issuance of the money, uh, which is to say the means, money in the sense of the means of payment denominated in that currency, and third, benefiting uh, from the seniorage um, uh, thereof. Um, banking theory banking theory stands for the commodity theory of money which which considers money to be a commodity like any other uh, based on private contracts now I probably the the central the central distinctive component of, of any currency teaching is uh, the separation of money and and, and banking the, the separation of money and credit this was uh, mentioned several times already in the course of our conference and um, uh, I think uh, that's true that, it, that this is indeed a very very a very very central uh, principle of any currency teaching it basically it says banks can and should be free enterprises but they should not be allowed to create themselves the money on which they operate that's the important thing and Banking teachings, of course, <laughs> they don't agree. <laughs> um, and uh, they say uh, um, money and credit cannot be separate because they are ad identical by their very nature. And this is, of course, uh, this is certainly true if, uh, from a banking perspective, of loaning money uh, into circulation. Uh, that's for sure. And that's why. Um, Banking, banking theory also says that creation of money comes with an according, creation of an according debt and um, an, an interest-bearing debt and a debt which has to be redeemed. And currency teachings on the, uh, on the other side, uh, seen from a currency point of view, money can be debt money but does not necessarily be debt money. It can be issued debt free as it was done for about 2,500 years uh, of coin currency, currencies. Now after this brief uh, synopsis uh, I want to say that one would not be altogether wrong in saying that the left side elements of this synopsis uh, are certainly are largely in line with the analyses and policy approaches put forth uh, by most contemporary reform initiatives, there are there are certainly um, 
many details and, and uh, varieties uh, w that are different, but, but basically regarding these fundamental principles, uh, contemporary reform initiati uh, initiatives uh, converge along uh, these lines. Furthermore, most advocates or supporters of monetary reform explicitly understand uh, what they are doing as an endeavor to modernize money, which of course implies modernizing money theory. And um, MMT, modern money theory, explicit in its name, uh, says to have modernized money theory and I want to say yes that's of course true but not entirely in the same way and not to the same extent. Um, for example MMT declares itself to represent a state theory of money and to stand for sovereign currency and one mu thus might expect it to be a currency teaching too. Uh, however as it turns out MMT's positioning within this field of currency versus banking is in fact rather ambiguous, uh, not to say uh, contradictory at times. Uh, for example, uh, MMT um, says that um, even under contemporary fractional reserve banking we do have a sovereign currency system and that fractional reserve banking is basically uh, an, um, a benign implementation of a sovereign currency uh, system. And this, of course, this, this creates some, say, misunderstanding and talking past one another from the beginning. Nonetheless, <coughs> nonetheless I, we should be aware that, in actual fact, there are a number of, of important aspects with regard to analyzing the present uh, modern money system, um, uh, a number of important aspects that MMT and currency theory have in common. And these aspects include that the monetary system is constitutive to modern economies because of the financialization of uh, industrial societies. Uh, it's not just, uh, as neoclassical theory has it, not just the wheel on the economy. It's an important foundation. And that modern money, of course, is fiat money. That the metal age of money is definitely over. And that the standard model of the credit or money multiply is obsolete, as M Michael Kumhoff has explained this morning. And that bank credit creates deposits and not the other way around and that uh, accordingly also uh, the loan of a funds model is obsolete which says that first you have to, to save and you have to create a stock of capital that you can invest so that uh, first you have to accumulate a stock of money b before you can invest and uh, that's not the case under modern money conditions. Investment is basically not dependent on savings and money or capital shortage does need not be if there is an according will among the political and financial elites. Also that central banks always accommodate banks' demand for reserves and these are, I cannot go into detail here, but this is just to say that I just list this up and uh, I think it's important to be aware of it and to keep in mind that uh, MMT and currency theory indeed have a number of important views uh, in common. Now, beyond the aspects listed here, there are, I'm sad to say, fewer commonalities between modern money theory and currency theory than one might expect. And I will raise now six questions uh, in which, uh, on which MMT and currency theory diverge. And the first is uh, on uh, the assessment of fractional reserve banking and the need for monetary reform. Uh, to currency theories, um, fractional reserve banking comes with a longer list uh, of dysfunctions such as uh, monetary instability, inflation, asset inflation, the distortion of the income distribution, um, uh, boom and bust cycles of course, and last but not least, banking crises. And uh, 
to modern money theory, by contrast, I had to find out, I was surprised to find out, I have to say, uh, fractional reserve banking basically is not a problem. Basically, it is seen as a well-functioning and benign arrangement. And al um, already a hundred years ago, Mitchell Innes, one of the uh, forefathers of MMT, so to say, had already, I would say, idealized in a, in a banking theoretical uh, stance, uh, reserve banking as a, quote, wonderfully efficient machinery of the banks, oh, unquote. Now, of course, um, MMT does not want to, does, does not ignore or deny um, uh, ongoing crises, of course not. And so, uh, um, Initially, initially, Minsky was not a, a forefather of MMT, but uh, over time they have also adopted uh, Minsky as another forefather of theirs and Minsky disequilibrium theory. Uh, as far as I could find out, however, I have to say that uh, this um, adoption of, of Minsky's uh, theory is somewhat half-hearted in that it acknowledges credit and debt bubbles as a major cause of crises but does not systematically investigate in the causation of primary credit and debt bubbles uh, through banks in a fractional reserve system. So th they say there, there, there are cr um, credit and debt bubbles but the primary cause for the credit and debt bubbles, fractional reserve banking is, so to say, blinded out, it's, it's blocked out, so to say. That's why I say it's half-hearted. Well, and accordingly, uh, MMT does not really recognize the need for monetary reform and uh, correspondingly contemporary reform approaches aimed at replacing bank money with some sort of sovereign money are not even discussed so far uh, by MMT. If MMT has a monetary reform, I want, to, I want to underline a monetary reform idea, it relates, uh, in the words of Ray, to, uh, quote, that strange prohibition to put on a sovereign issuer of the currency. That is, for the treasury having to sell its bonds to banks rather than directly to the government. That, of course, that implies a certain reform perspective, but I have to say uh, this remains rather indirect or implicit. It's not really, it's not really worked out explicitly uh, as a reform perspective. Um, another divergence is uh, on the question whether we do have a sovereign currency system or a banking regime and whether the government is a creditor or adapter. And to any currency theory so far, government is seen as debtor, not creditor. Government goes in debt with banks and banks refinance at the central bank. That's the common view of, of what's going on. And banks refinance at the central bank fully to the extent that government accounts are with the central bank and fractionally to the extent that government accounts are with banks. Uh, MMT, however, says that government is creditor, a creditor of its own, of its, a creator of its own money, uh, and thus is a creditor rather than debtor to others. MMT assumes that by issuing government debentures, the government issues its own money, which is to say that government debt equals sovereign money. Government debt equals sovereign money. And MMT thus holds that even the present money and banking system represents a sovereign currency system. And uh, it is said uh, over and again that government debt should not be seen as debt. Government debt is a special kind of debt which is not debt, at least not in the same way as private debt, which is, to me, all the more puzzling as MMT otherwise insists on all money being debt. Uh, 
MMT even generalizes uh, this position by assuming that treasury spending equals money creation. Whenever the treasury spends, this represents money creation. And I think this is completely misleading and because the biggest part, what MMT denies, but in my view, uh, the big, and not only in my view, the biggest part of government expenditure is funded by taxes and tax revenues represent transfer of already existing money. And the money that serves for paying taxes is neither extinguished upon paying taxes nor is it created or say recreated when government spends its tax revenue. In actual fact, this is all about simple circulation of existing money. Now an additional part of government expenditure is funded by selling government IOUs to non-banks like you and me and to funds and so on. And going in debt with non-banks this means secondary unlending of already existing money. This does not include money creation, but this is secondary credit, which means unlending of already uh, created money. It does not involve primary credit and debt creation. Primary credit and debt creation only happens when government takes up additional debt with banks. And this, it should be noted, this happens as long as the banks want it to happen, not as long as government wants it to happen. And uh, if banks and the bond markets turn thumbs down, then the would-be sovereign money game is suddenly over. Uh, MMT probably thinks that this could not happen in America, but it happens again and again across the world. For uh, MMT's assertion to make sense, either we have to assume a conventional money mul multiplier process between banks and government, which MMT says not to assume, or else the entire amount of bonds would have to be absorbed by the central bank in exchange for reserves and cash. Banks, however, in actual fact, empirically or practically, pass on to the central bank only a small part of government bonds. In Europe, for example, the left side of this slide, uh, Central bank holdings of public debt were in, in pre-crisis times only about 0.x percent up to 4 percent at maximum. This cannot be seen in this picture. What can be seen here is that the, the banking industry holds uh, the, major part of, uh, the major part of government debt. It's the banks, it's not the central bank. No. So, on the right side you see the situation in the United States and uh, the Federal Reserve's holdings of government debt, that's the, the, uh, the, the bottom part of it, it represents about 11 to 14 percent. And this, that's not too important either. This is uh, are the, the results from a, an, um, a study um, by uh, IMF researchers Aslan Alp and Tsuda, and uh, it's a bit, the, the results are a bit different, but uh, in tendency it's the same result, a similar result, saying that uh, what domestic and foreign central banks together hold in, um, in sovereign debt is only the minor part and not the major part uh, of um, now, as I said before, MMT assumes modern nation states to be in command of a sovereign currency system, what they call chattel money. And part of this is the construct of the central bank and the government financially belonging together in one sector, the public or state sector, in contrast to the private sector. And uh, government and central bank are assumed to cooperate 
in uh, monetary as well as fiscal policies and to provide in tandem, so to say, um, the economy uh, with the sovereign currency that the banks and the economy need. And banks' role in this is said to be one of well-intentioned intermediaries, well-intentioned intermediaries between government and central bank, as well as between government and taxpayers. And here again, I cannot prevent from thinking that this contradicts, this contradicts MMT's own assumptions that uh, banks create, uh, create bank money the, and determine the entire money supply uh, proactively and rather independently of what central banks and governments do. Um, I think that MMT's own description of how fractional reserve banking works would rather suggest siding with the currency theories assessment of the present banking system. And this assessment, quite to the contrary, is that today we may pro forma uh, still have a two-tier mixed system of um, sovereign paper currency and bank money. De facto, however, this has turned into a near-complete banking system. Uh, de facto, there is a monopoly of bank money, a monopoly of, of demand deposits or transaction deposits, however you call it. That's our money. That's what the entire economy operates on. And uh, the banking industry, in fact, fully determines uh, the process of money creation. I mean, a certain, part, a certain part of the coins still come from the treasury, and in most countries, uh, the, the central bank uh, um, has the monopoly on banknotes. But uh, whether banknotes are issued, that's decided by the banks. And the banknotes are, of, co of course, not just spent into circulation but uh, they are sold, sold to say, or loaned to the banks uh, in, in a crediting process. Now, the next, uh, the next divergence is, or should I say, whether, whether MMT, as I said, it's, it seems to be another currency theory, but in actual fact, one quite often quite often one has to think it, it's another banking theory. What, now what is it? A, a currency um, uh, or a banking, a state theory or a banking theory of money? And uh, related to this question is um, that um, their understanding of what chartalism means, of what that includes, chartal money or, or public money. And most people spontaneously uh, understand by state money or chattel money a means of payment issued by the treasury or by the central bank of a country. And actually, there was a, a survey in Europe asking people where does money come from. And 80% 80, 80 of the people thought it, in some way it comes from the government. It's government money. People had not the idea that it's bank money. And uh, um, a similar view uh, understanding by, um, by state money, money issued by, by the government or another uh, state body, that view is also held by currency scholars and as far as I can see also by most of today's monetary reformers. A state's monetary prerogative as explained above in, in the synopsis already uh, actually uh, encompasses uh, three components. The first is determining the national unit of account. The second is issuing uh, the money denominated in that currency. And the third is benefiting from the seniorage thereof. These are three components. And MMT only acknowledges the first one. Uh, not, however, the second and the third. And um, uh, this reflects a typical attitude of 19th century national liberalism, which is particularly present in the state theory of money by Knapp, Georg Friedrich Knapp, um, 
um, and uh, MMT uh, refers la largely refers to Knapp and Michelinus in this respect. And to Knapp, it was not really important whether a nation's money is issued uh, by the state or a state body. This can be, but does not need to be the case. And the state's basic role, according to Knapp, um, is to define the national currency unit, just as the state defines unified weights and measures. And then the decisive factor for the establishment of a general means of payment uh, is what a state's treasury accepts uh, in payment of taxes and what state agencies use themselves um, in fulfillment of their obligations. And if the government accepts and uses bank money, then of course bank money is the official currency. That's the logic. And uh, this teaching on currency or money was carried forward, I think actually by Keynes. Uh, the younger Keynes was a bit more critical towards fractional reserve banking. Over time, I think he, he thought exactly that. And it was particularly adopted by Abba Lerner and again by MMT. And MMT's charterism can thus be characterized as being a partial, a partial charterism, as being incomplete in that it includes only the first of three components. And uh, this difference of concept explains why in modern money theory fractional reserve banking actually can be interpreted as a charter or sovereign money system and why bank money can be seen as an integral part of an alleged uh, sovereign money supply. In the beginning, I didn't understand that. It took me uh, several months to find out. Mm. As a result, MMT, far from representing a currency position, actually stands for a banking regime, uh, formerly a two-tier mixed system still, but de facto, as I said, a near complete, turned into a near complete banking system. Now I come to that question of whether all money is necessarily debt. And uh, as I also have said, currency teachings, core principle is currency t of currency teachings is to separate money creation from banking. And uh, new money, of course, can loan into existence as credit and interest bearing debt by the credit, the, the money issuing uh, uh, authority. Um, but can equally be spent into circulation free of interest and redemption, thus stand free. And um, my, my personal opinion on this is that the major part, as much as possible, should be spent debt-free if possible. But there, can, but there can certainly be good reasons and good arguments for reserving a minor part of the entire money supply to be to be put in circulation via different different ways, including including the banks. Knapp, yes, Knapp left this question open whether or not um, debt or not debt. Mitchell Innes, uh, however, Mitchell Innes, in, in a in a in an almost compulsory way, I would say, insisted on the nature of money, as he said, the nature of money. Uh, to be credit and debt. And uh, Bessemer, um, a Dutch economist, and in that uh, MMT uh, uh, group, he uh, of late in, a, in, in an interview on Icelandic TV, he ridiculed monetary reformers by comparing the notion of debt-free money to something as impossible as dry water. Dry water is impossible, cannot be, and so we are illusionist, so to say. Now, uh, from a banking point of view, uh, this is certainly a matter of course. As I said, if, if you understand, if you identify money with credit, this is, of course, uh, this cannot be. 
a debt-free money. Mm. And so, again, I have to say, in, in my understanding, this is the purest form of banking doctrine, the purest form of banking doctrine I can, I can imagine, that bank money is a demand deposit created by the banks rep representing an interest-bearing debt, etc., etc. We should see, however, that this um, has become predominant only in the last 200 or, say, 250 years, and prior to this, in actual fact and as a rule, uh, traditional coin currencies for about 2,500 years were created and issued debt-free by being spent rather than loaned into circulation by the rulers of uh, the realm who had reserved for the state the monetary prerogative of coinage and seigniorage. That's the second and the third part uh, of the monetary prerogative. The coinage as the issuance of the money and taking in the seigniorage, the profit that accrues from, from creating and issuing uh, new money. Now to me, personally, it's very plausible to say that historically money has developed in a context of social obligations, duties and debts of various kinds and that's from a sociological point of view. That's simply to say that society is built on mutuality, taking from others, having to give to others. That's mutuality, that's the very stuff of social relations, of, of social textures. But it is implausible to me, and it uh, seems to be, uh, I see it very, very far-fetched to derive from this, the strong hypothesis that all money necessarily is credit and debt. Uh, that's, that's, that's going too far, that's over-interpreted. And money, um, to me it's trivial to say, no matter whether you speak of the unit of account or of the means of payment, and um, that was already stated in the paper by the two Stevens, by, by, by uh, Walsh and Sarlenga. Money simply is, is an unconditional instrument, an, a, an instrument for handling credit and debt, and thus <coughs> uh, cannot normally in itself be credit and debt. The idea of paying a debt with another debt of the same kind, uh, that may seem to make some sense within a framework of banking type reasoning. Um, outside such self-contained reasoning, however, it, it is much less obvious. Uh, so the equation of debt, uh, money equals debt, uh, this is just an, uh, another example of banking doctrinal confusion, in my opinion. Because it confuses the instrument with the object, that is to say, first, it erroneously identifies the unit of account with what is accounted or measured. And second, it confuses the means of payment with what has to be paid. And that has to be kept apart, analytically and practically. In addition, as I want to repeat, uh, the equation of money is debt, the wrong equation of money is debt, this ignores or misrepresents 2,500 years of kind currencies when new additional money typically was bent into circulation free of interest uh, and redemption. Uh, you know this inscription on a one dollar note, uh, upper side left, I have seen on, on uh, other dollar notes of higher denomina uh, de denomination, this inscription is on the down left, and, and it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Yes, that's what it is. And this inscription is absolutely appropriate, and it does not need uh, further interpretation, say. And of course that dollar note, as any other dollar note, um, um, does not need to be loaned into existence and thus create interest-borne seigniorage to the issuer, because today's understanding of seigniorage is always interest-borne seigniorage. It's the, in, the, it's the seigniorage uh, accruing from, from having, from crediting money into existence. 
the amount of money can also of money involved can equally be spent into circulation as plain sovereign money but money on account because that's the the most important means of payment today money on account digital money on account and this creates debt free genuine seigniorage and this this is equal to structure to the type of seigniorage uh, of traditional coin currencies. So debt-free money, to come back to Bessemer's dry water metaphor, debt-free money might rather be likened to pure water, as I want to say, pure water not contingent at source upon credit and debt already. Uh, by the way, I agree with what several speakers here have said, how to, how to account for, for sovereign money. And the analogy is exactly with the, coin, with the traditional coin. Uh, new money, modern money, should be accounted for in the same way as coin is, current, is accounted for. That makes much sense. And this means that it is when, it, when it enters a government or a central bank um, a balance sheet, it, 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 it will never be a liability, it's either an, it, it's an equity. So when the money is created, it is immediately capitalized, speaking in, in uh, accountancy uh, term, terminology. You know? That's, that's uh, the, the, uh, the way of how to express this appropriately in, in modern accounting. Um, there is uh, another. There is another aspect of MMT I should that should briefly be addressed, and this concerns sector balances, as mentioned before. You know, the state sector and the private sector, and possibly a third sector, if need be, uh, representing the, the rest of world. Now, um, so consolidating central bank and government, the treasury and central bank, and so on, in in a a public sector or state sector and consolidating everything else in the private sector that reminds me I, I couldn't prevent from thinking of that um, the cover, uh, the cover uh, picture of the New Yorker from I think it was 19, 1976 I know it's not appropriate but for some reason I could not prevent from thinking of it and maybe the reason is that it seems to me that that this uh, consolidated, consolidated uh, that two-sector model consolidating central bank and treasury into one sector um, that's a similar, a similar to me it's a similar oversimplification uh, of the world than that view of the world is similar maybe another cause is that there is Kansas City so to say the headquarter of MMT right on in the middle of the middle uh, Maybe a bit far-fetched, yes. <laughs> doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, howsoever, uh, the starting point is that in a system of sector accounts, the sum of all balances nets out to zero. And uh, sector balances owe, owe much to Keynes, the development of uh, sector balances. The emphasis of Keynes, however, I want to stress, the emphasis of Keynes was on identifying imbalances uh, which were seen as problematic and more problematic the bigger the imbalances grew. Uh, for example the Bangkok plan for a world trading order uh, Keynes wanted to put on the agenda of Bretton Woods in 1944 that plan was, to desi was designed to avoid, avoid big trade and current account imbalances yeah. MNT, however, and again not too, not too explicit about this, suggests a certain reinterpretation of public-private sector balances and the emphasis in, in, uh, in the MNT liter literature, the emphasis is on pointing out that for government debt, net government debt in the public sector, there are corresponding private fortunes uh, in the private sector, which is to say that within this simplifi simplified, I'll say, over-consolidated framework of the two-sector model, 
uh, private financial fortunes seem to necessitate public debt. In any case, both sides netting out to zero, as if this were to say, uh, you see, uh, things are netting out, no problem here. But problems there are. For example, that much of the public debt in, U in Europe, actually the major part, is held by banks, another big slice by other financial institutions and insurance companies, and only a minor part of public debt is, is held by private households. And in connection to this, the holding of bonds, and thus the receipt of related interest payments, is very, very unequally distributed as Joe Bonciovanni uh, has explained to us. Uh, furthermore, uh, much of the debt is held by foreigners, and if the, the, um, the percentage that is held by foreigners um, grows beyond a certain critical thresholds, uh, that comes with political and economic problems of its own, problems of dependency and not of monetary sovereignty. Yeah. MMT, however, tells us not to bother um, about the level of public debt and the soundness of public finances. Um, the government is not really supposed to pay down its allegedly just formal debt. Um, to me, however, it makes not for sound finances to enter claims and liabilities in whosoever balance sheet, a government's balance sheet or a central bank's balance sheet, entering it as, as, as a credit and debt uh, while declaring the corresponding debt not really to be a debt. I can't understand this. No. No. Uh, Mosler, however, um, as far as I know, one of the, the founder or the one who gave the, the initial kick for creating modern money uh, theory, Mosler says that financial restraints in a fiat money system, in a modern money system, are imaginary. And Ray uh, even contends that, quote, for a sovereign nation, affordability is not an issue. It spends by crediting bank accounts with its own IOUs, something it can never run out of. Well, yes, uh, I mean, he has a point. They have a point, yes. But uh, never mind. Such statements are really overshooting, overshooting the mark by far. And any treasurer of sovereign state with its own currency and rotten finances can tell. You do not think of Zimbabwe. Um, yesterday evening we, we talked on Iceland and there are many more countries that could be uh, cited, quoted here. Now Ray at least notes, for example, that running a foreign account deficit is basically as he says, a beggar thy neighbor strategy. Yes, that's what it is. But uh, I'm astonished how um, he does say this, and that's all. And uh, which means he, he does not draw any conclusion from this, and he does, he does, he does not more analyze and uh, explain what it means. He says, it's a beggar thy neighbor strategy, and then he goes on to it's not within the scope of our analysis. So, uh, Who is that? Ray, Randall Ray, yes. Randall Ray is the MMT author. Yeah. Now, I myself, um, I would not want to put myself out for monetary reform uh, just to see unsound money printing by the banks uh, being replaced with unsound money printing by the government. That, that it would not make sense. Now I come to the end and uh, trying to give a brief answer to the question whether or not MMT and currency theory can go together and uh, whether MMT might be supportive of monetary reform and the answer on balance is not as positive as one might have hoped for. MMT I have to conclude that MMT, in contrast to its self-image, represents banking theory much more than currency teachings. And its understanding of sovereign currency and monetary sovereignty is misleadingly incomplete. 
And as a matter of fact, MMT so far has not supported monetary reform. And uh, of course, uh, we should be aware of, of the fact that we share a, a number of important analytical point of views on the present systems, but I have to conclude that divergencies, as discussed, are uh, outweighed commonalities and, and will be hard to bridge. There might be, might be some common ground if MMT would develop an explicit, worked out concept for doing away with that, I, I, again I quote Ray, that strange prohibition to put on a sovereign issuer of the currency, that is, not to directly issue its own sovereign money. So if MMT would develop some concept of direct issuance of sovereign money, this could be, as Michael Hudson told me, as Michael Hudson put it, this could be indeed a key premise one is pushing in common, but not for the time being as far as I can see. You may now judge yourself what the odds are of MMT and monetary reform go together. Uh, for me, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.